Let's be real, Dragon Ball The Breakers is probably the most hated, most dismissed Dragon Ball game by the community that we've had in a very long time. And from my understanding, that comes from two major things. One, the graphics. And two, it's a completely different genre from what Dragon Ball fans are used to. And I've had the chance to finally play it for the first time in the last closed beta, and I honestly think that the hate towards this game isn't deserved at all. But I also understand why no one's defending it super hard. The game is okay. That's it. I think it will go down in history as a very unremarkable Dragon Ball game, but it's one that has the potential to be here for many years to come. It is built to last just like Xenoverse 2 was. And the game doesn't need to be this resounding success. It's got a smaller budget than usual. You can tell a lot of the resources are recycled from Xenoverse, but at the same time, Bandai seems to be okay with that. It's a smaller Dragon Ball game, one that you release between two other Dragon Ball games to give these bigger games more development time. You release something so you don't lose the license, or at least least, that is my guess as to what this is. Even the pricing suggests that this isn't the next big Dragon Ball game. It's a smaller thing, and I honestly applaud the effort to do something different with Dragon Ball, following the model of games like Dead by Daylight and Friday the 13th. Once you adjust your expectations to that smaller budget, that smaller size, suddenly this doesn't seem like such a bad game, but at the same time, in the context of modern gaming, this is just okay. And the game largely succeeds what it sets out to do, but it being Dragon Ball, a lot more people were paying attention, and this is a game for a lot of those people, so it's hard to shut down the noise of hate. Today I want to give my honest opinion on the game, or at least the concept that they're going for. Why it's not really a bad game, but they've created an impossible problem for themselves, so it will never be great either. Why I think that instead it will stay in this middle ground where eventually it will fall into forgetfulness. And I also want to give my feedback on things they could improve, because they are clearly listening to player feedback. So let's jump into it. First of all, we had some typical beta problems that we expect to be fixed when the game finally releases, namely, we had some incredible, unstable matchmaking. Whenever matchmaking did work, we would also have very long matchmaking times, especially during the first slot. I think during the four hours of the first slot, I did the tutorial and like three games? For four hours? It was very hard to find a game, let alone finding one fast, despite it always saying that the average waiting time was around one minute. Now, this did improve for the other beta slots, so maybe it was just a temporary hiccup. However, there are a few things that I think could help with matchmaking times, even if they fix this matchmaking system. First of all, new players are just gonna queue up for a match as fast as possible. They're gonna click play game, go, without even looking at all the options they have available. So I recommend, first and foremost, make the map selection random by default. As it is in the beta, the first map is selected as your preferred map. Most players were just selecting that map because they didn't even see the option. By making the default option random, you are increasing the amount of matchmaking options that you have available. So if someone selects the second map, the random players can also fit into that matchmaking queue. And consider perhaps doing the same for the role preference. By default, it is set to survivors and for sure, the game needs more survivors playing than it needs raiders. It is a 7 versus 1 game. But if you set it to random by default, that means that players that just want to play the video game will probably not get mad if they end up getting a survivor. This should give the matchmaking system more options, which in turn will result in less waiting times for us players. Especially for beginners who haven't found the buttons to set their preferences yet. Maybe then the average wait time will actually be one minute instead of this. Practice mode is definitely a great addition to the game and one that I look forward to seeing expanded on. Being able to try every tool the game has to offer before jumping into a match was super helpful. And the tutorial also does a good job at explaining what the goal of the survivor is, but it's missing something crucial. What do you do once you encounter the raider? Everything in this tutorial works great, as long as the raider doesn't find you. But once they do, you will feel completely lost for the first few games. Raiders are definitely more powerful and in general you should be trying to run away. However, there are things that you can do, not always completely lost once the raider finds you. The first time that I ran into a raider, I had a transformation and I had the Vegeta gloves with a Gallic gun. In my mind, I would be able to fight even if for a very limited amount of time. Or at the very least delay the raider a little bit so my teammates could escape. But that was not the case. Every single move I tried to throw was interrupted. I felt completely powerful those abilities were useless. And I know that feeling powerless is part of the gimmick, that's the idea the game is going for. But then why the hell are we able to power up? Why the hell are we able to shoot Gallic guns with these gloves? What are they for exactly? Later, when I started using those abilities not to fight but to run away, it's like I finally understood what they were for. And if you want to use them offensively, you generally want to catch the raider off guard and even then it's used for a surprise attack and not much more. Unless someone on your team has gathered all the Dragon Balls and became a very powerful 
Tactical Fighter and jumped the radar. But the game didn't teach me any of this during the tutorial, I had to learn it the hard way. In fact, when I learned the most about fighting against the radar was when I played as the radar themselves and could see which abilities they had. Knowing that one of my radar's abilities was sort of a combo breaker ability where you just blow the opponent away from you really changed my perspective on how to approach battles. Now I'm not saying that the tutorial should teach you how to beat the raider because that's not the point of the game, but it should tell you hey, if the raider finds you, the game isn't over, here's what you can do. Anyway, when you do fight the raider, as the raider or against it, these fights feel super awkward. I think this is one of the reasons why people aren't vibing with this game at all, because when you jump a raider, you can either stun lock them until they die, or they can feel like an unbeatable powerhouse no matter how powerful you are. Over time, I think we'll get more comfortable, but right now at the start, the fighting feels terrible, and that's not what you want out of a Dragon Ball game. But the main issue that breaks this game for me personally is the problem they created for themselves. This game is impossible to balance. And I don't mean to say that it's hard to balance because it's a 7v1 game, which I mean it is, absolutely, it's very hard, but I mean it's actually impossible, and it has to do with the progression. I had no idea that this game was gonna have random pulls, basically a gacha system where you can get not only cosmetics, but also skills and passive buffs, and these make such a big difference for survivors. Having a passive power generation on top of finding energy in the field was a massive power difference for me as a survivor. Having the Saiyan pod at my disposal for whenever the raider attacked raised my survivability through the roof. And now let's imagine that these developers dimps, they are capable of finding the perfect balance in a 7v1 game. Let's say they are geniuses and they can actually achieve that. Do they balance this game for new players and free to play with some basic skills? Or do they balance this for the whales putting hundreds of dollars into this game? You can't have both. This makes it very hard for me personally to play this game long term. I had fun in the beta and I can definitely see myself going back to it once in a while, but very casually and probably never by myself, always with friends. I can't see myself investing too much time into a game that in the end has no interest in being balanced. I, I can have fun with it, but very casually and very occasionally. It also feels like the progression is very shallow, so I don't feel like there's anything to work towards. There are some skills to be purchased with in-game currency, but the best stuff seems to either cost real money or you find it randomly in gacha drops. And as far as cosmetics go, I don't like the look of any of these pieces of clothing, except for maybe the ones that cost real money. I understand if they're making the best stuff only purchasable with real money, that is clearly their business plan, they're gonna sell you the game and then they're gonna sell you skins. That's where we're buying into and we know that from the get-go. But if those are the only ones that look good, then I have nothing to work towards as I play the game. If I want that stuff, I just put in the money, I don't need to play, which kind of defeats the whole purpose. The shop is obviously still a placeholder, things will change and there will be other items on display, but if this beta is any indication of where their head is at, then I have no interest in unlocking anything that's unlockable with in-game currency. And without progression, it just reinforces that feeling that this isn't the game to sink a huge amount of time into. It's just something to boot up and play a couple of games with friends. I don't know what their update plan is, but it better be good and not too expensive. Otherwise, I really think this game is gonna live or die by streamers. Anyway, the game is okay. Is it something that resonates with a general Dragon Ball fandom? No. Is it something that resonates with me? Not really, but I can't deny that I had a good time. Is it something that I'll play in the future? Yeah, at 20 bucks, I'll buy it and enjoy some sessions with friends. I have no problem doing that, but it's my 20 bucks. Money isn't worth the same to everybody, so if you want to save 20 bucks, by all means. Me, I'll be following this game's progress, checking back in every update or so, but is it something that I'll be practicing every day and getting better at? Probably not. In my opinion, this concept could have worked a lot better without the random tickets, you know, the gacha stuff. If you put all the skills in a natural progression, that gives players something to work towards. That solves the progression problem and makes balance something that is a bit more attainable, because you know how long it would take players to unlock certain skills. And then you can match them with raiders who are around the same level, because raiders, as they level up, they can put skill points into their abilities too, reducing their cooldowns. It's just a cooldown reduction, so nothing as drastic as gaining a whole other skill, like, let's say, the Saiyan pod, but still, they do get stronger over time. Instead, they are completely randomizing progression with the gacha system, which makes it impossible to balance, and for me, impossible to take seriously or dedicate a lot of time into. This is a game that I will play very casually, and I honestly don't know for how long, but I did enjoy my time with it, and that's the kind of game that Dragon Ball The Breakers is for me. But what about you? Did you try the beta? How did you like it? Let me know how you're feeling about this very divisive game in the comments down below. And if you want to give some feedback, there is a feedback form that they submitted to all the beta players but if I'm being honest, I don't think they're asking the right questions. Most of the feedback I just gave in this video doesn't fit the feedback form at all. But let me know what you thought of it. And as always, thank you very much for watching. My name is Globku and I'll see you next time.
But 